Welcome to another Words of Hope pastoral conversation. My name is Brian Venton and today's reflection is titled Fear Not. Again, we're focusing on Psalm 91 and this time from verses 5 to 6. But I want to start by reading verses 3 and 4, which we looked at last week, just to give us some context. For he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome, meaning deadly, obnoxious or rank pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is as a shield and a buckler. Then 5 and 6 says this, You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by the day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. Now, I don't know if you have noticed, but there are two ideas here that consciously or otherwise are not a normal part of our lives. Let me explain what I mean. The writer declares in forthright terms that God is our refuge. He is our fortress. He will be our protector as a buckler and a shield. And now in today's text, he says, you will not fear. Now, it's sad, but many of us, including myself, don't always live in this space. The notion that we can live under the shadow of the Almighty is a challenge to the human rational thinking process. It often gets factored out of our mindset most of the time. Now the question here is if what the psalmist is saying is here true, then why do so many people live as if it's not true? If the text says you will not fear, then why are so many people crippled by fear, or as the text describes it, as a people who succumbs to the terror of the night, or the arrow that flies by the day, or the stalking pestilence of the night, the wasting destruction of the noonday? Well, what does it mean to not fear? What is the antonym of fear? There are multiple words used in the dictionaries and thesauruses that can give us a clue of what the alternative might be to not living in fear. They could include living in a mental state of being untroubled, happy, peaceful and contented, cool-headed, calm and relaxed, mindful, aware and even tempered. If I had to think of two words to describe what it means to not live in fear, then they would be the words courage and confidence. Now, from a secular perspective, this is often thought of as living with self-confidence and self-courage. But that, in my view, is a bit like pulling ourselves up by our own bootstrings. I suggest that if we drop the idea of self in this description, we could then ask ourselves the question, where do we obtain confidence and courage? so we are not crippled by fear. When we draw it from ourselves, our reserve supply is always finite, and we invariably become dependent on the next fix of self-talk to top up when our well runs dry. Now, let's be clear what all this doesn't mean. It doesn't mean that you and I won't get sick or have an accident or be impacted Uh, adversely by an event, either self-induced or by some poor adventure. No, it means that we can rest in and trust in the God who can deliver us in spite of the noise and pestilence. Does it mean we don't take precautions for our health? Not at all. But our response is not to be based on fear or self-talk, but on courage and confidence in what God says can be true for us. Now let that sink in a moment. Now, let me give you a couple of illustrations to help us make sense of what I'm talking about here. In the 19th century and long before that, diseases and epidemics often ravaged the world. Death by disease ripped its way through town and country. It was a lived experience for many people. Now Spurgeon, who was a Baptist minister in the 1800s, on one occasion said this, and it's really interesting, too many among us are weak in faith and in fact place more reliance in a vial or a globule 
than in the Lord, the giver of life. Living in the shadow of the Almighty, he says, removes all gloom from the shadow of the night. Beautifully written. How relevant are those words for us today? Now, a few centuries earlier, the bubonic plague of London in 1965-66 killed approximately 70,000 people. It absolutely devastated London. The story is told how Lord Craven, who lived in London during that period as the epidemic raged, his lordship, to avoid the danger like many of the other lords of, of, of London, resolved to go to his seat in the country. His coach and his six servants were assembled at the door. His baggage was put up on the rack and all things done in readiness for the journey. And as he was walking through his hallway, with his hat on, his cane under his arms and putting on his gloves, in order to step into his carriage, he overheard one of his Negro servants saying to another servant these words. I suppose by my Lord's quitting London to avoid the plague that his God lives in the country and not in the town. Now, his servant wasn't being disrespectful here, but simply stating what he believed in his heart, for he believed in a plurality of gods. The speech, however, struck Lord Craven deeply and made him pause. And he said this, My God lives everywhere and can preserve me in town as well as in country. I will even stay where I am. He then said in typical 17th century language, the ignorance of that Negro has just now preached to me a very useful sermon. Lord, pardon this my unbelief and that distrust of thy providence, which made me think of running from thy hand. Now, the recorder writes that Lord Craven then immediately ordered his horses to be taken from the coach and the baggage to be taken in. He continued on in London and was remarkably useful among his sick neighbours and townsfolk and never caught the infection himself. Friends, our confidence and courage to face anything in the future rests not in our own selves, but in the reality of knowing that God is both a town and a country God who speaks into our most fearful moments and we ought to then live in the light of that reality. Now, I trust this conversation has been helpful for you today and if you are struggling in your own circumstance about these things, then feel free to give me a call. As you know, I'm always on for a chat. Now, if you have found what I've said today helpful, then share it with your friends and perhaps you can subscribe as well to my YouTube channel so you won't miss future pastoral conversations. But until next week, may God bless you and thanks again for watching. Goodbye.